Yeah, welcome everybody um, to our presentation on how to pick your pie. I know a lot of people are really excited about pies, but they don't know where to start, and that's kind of where Tim and I were. So we got uh, we got our feet wet and we started in. Uh, so my name is Jed Anderson. Um, I am the development manager of the SDC product line uh, for for Genius Tech. <clears throat> and with me is Tim Webb. Um, I, uh, I've had a long history with the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, I was actually an employee of OTI way back when, when they first started writing Eclipse, and I've been in the Eclipse space for a long, long time. Um, and I'll let Tim talk to his history as well. All right, uh, welcome. I am Tim Webb. Thanks, Jed. I am the Director of Innovation at, and an Eclipse enthusiast over at uh, Genio Tech. Been doing quite a bit of Eclipse over the years, many, many Eclipse cons, a number of talks. Um, and this year, we're looking forward to just having fun with the pies, as you know. Internet of Things, IoT, all this cool excitement. Um, so today's talk is going to be focused on the cool things you can do. Now, with obligatory disclaimer, yes, we're from Genua Tech. We are a commercial entity, so I apologize for that. We're not just here because of open source. We will not be focusing on that today, though. We're going to be talking about the cool things. Everything we're doing here is up on GitHub, it's open source, licensed under EPL. We're not trying to pitch product. Yes, we do really cool stuff. I'll admit it. We love our products. Um, but we're really focused on the, the open source side of, uh, of Eclipse and the things you can do with it today. So uh, as we'll be going through today, uh, the rough agenda is all about this thing called PyPlug. It's a way to kind of bring together cool things with Eclipse and the Pi. And during the talk, you will have got your stickers with a number on the back. At the very end, we're going to be raffling away 15 Pi's. Due to logistics, we're not going to actually be giving them away right in the room. So you're going to hold on to that sticker, save that number. Uh, and you just come by the booth and we have all the pies right there ready to go. They're nice starter kits with everything from an HDMI cable to your SD card. So we should be able to get you up and get going very quickly. You can go back to the hotel room and actually you can't. The TVs are locked. I tried to do that. You cannot hook the pie up to the TVs in the hotel. Uh, so no, you can't try it. But, uh, so what are we really here to talk about? We're, this, there's this cool thing, the Raspberry Pi, or similar devices. To be fair, this talk doesn't only apply to the Raspberry Pi, any sort of the the ARM low-level uh, devices you can use this software on. Uh, and we have this platform Eclipse. It's an open source community of really cool things. Um, as we saw in the keynote with Mike, you know, Eclipse isn't just one thing. It's not just an IDE. It's also a framework, a set of services. Uh, and what we wanted to do was find a way to bridge these two cool communities together and, and do something neat with it. As Jed indicated, we both had our pies on our desk. And we're like, I want to do something with this. And uh, yes, you can do temperature sensors and you can uh, look at the, the, the values at the OS level of what's happening. But it becomes interesting when you can start to integrate that with a, a UI as well, uh, where you can start to actually visualize some of the data you're collecting, uh, very similar to trying to do with what Actuate's doing with their reporting. So we have this uh, Raspberry Pi, and then the fun thing about this EclipseCon and kind of the trend you see is IoT is, it's, has a huge traction. We're not all sure what it means. Uh, you know, there's lots of things that are yet to be defined. But there's a lot of excitement around this proliferation of these uh, devices that are now available. And the Raspberry Pi is a fun way to be able to experiment. You know, you can have it control your garage door, do lighting in your house, monitor temperatures. Uh, I, I know uh, Mike Malinkovich was looking at streaming video from his cabin using his Pi, or all sorts of cool things you can do with, uh, with your Pi. On the other hand, you have Eclipse, and Eclipse has all these cool services. It has Equinox. Equinox is a neat runtime. Uh, I know there's some other ones with like concierge that are happening. Um, that are providing more opportunities on what you can do on the Pi. And so what I wanted to do is spend this talk talking about uh, how we can bridge those two together using PyPlug. PyPlug is our simple uh, open source front end, and the whole idea is to provide a nice way for you to be able to use your Eclipse knowledge, your SWT knowledge, you can actually even go down and use Java FX if you want, to provide front ends, to provide a nice experience for your Pi. Now, when we sat down to do Pi, uh, it became clear that it's great at certain tasks. Once you have a runtime going, you can dynamically do things in it, and it performs where very well. But it can be slow to start. And so Pipeline, as we'll be going through today, uh, including how you can actually build your own applications, is all about getting the most from your Pi efficiently. So if we go ahead, and uh, I think we can uh, talk about the things you can do with the, the Pipeline, right? So what do we want it to enable? We want to enable you to be able to Create applications. Okay, cool, that's neat. Um, but an application can be just an OS check bundle, it can be a set of services. And what we wanted to do was, again, allow that Pi plug to let you create these different visualizations. And so during the demo today, we'll actually be showing the Pi running uh, different RCP front ends and some things we did as examples. 
um, and will allow you to see kind of the, what works well as well as what doesn't. Um, if you haven't tried to do it, you know, if you start up a whole eclipse, if you don't overclock your Pi, it will take 10 minutes to start up. Now, for those who haven't, you know, you can now actually legitimately overclock because they have temperature sensing and they'll slow down the processor so you don't burn it out. So you no longer void your warranty. If you did overclock, you can get that 10 minutes down to about 8 minutes to start the IDE. So, yes. Uh, so, uh, what we wanted to do is say, okay, all right, we're not going to wait 8 minutes for something to come up. We need something more responsive than that. And that brings us to Pi Plug. So, to get started, uh, we have an Eclipse running here. It has a view in it. You can install it from an update site. Uh, and the, we have these applications that are available in the view. So what I'm going to do is actually take a very quick look at one of the applications, and Jed's actually going to have us run Pipeline. So uh, we have over on the left, again, these are all available in GitHub. Uh, so we have, say, this clock application. Very simplistic. Uh, inside the clock, you have a, an iPyplug application entry point, uh, and that has certain methods. We'll, we'll explain those in a, in a moment. But the idea is just to provide a very simple OSGI bundle and really provide a pluggable front end. So you can have multiple applications deployed. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is deploy this first, this clock application. Apparently can't click today. Um, and that will do a, a PDE export is actually assembling the bundle and providing it available inside the uh, a, a daemon that's running on the server. So inside that daemon, and uh, apparently my view is being slow to refresh, so I'm going to go ahead and bring that up. Um, inside that, inside that uh, daemon. It is providing access to your um, servicing applications out to your Pi. So we have a, an Ethernet cable here, and uh, inside that Ethernet cable, we have a, just a local subnet going on, 192.168 for the course of the demo. Didn't want to rely on the Wi-Fi. Um, I'm going to go ahead and restart my clip because it's a demonstration, and therefore everything is going to go a little bit funky. Um, so apologies for that. Uh, but what happens with inside Eclipse when I use that view is it's starting a day. Now, you could run one out on your home. Um, it could be just out on your Pi itself. And the daemon is a repository of your bundles. And so the idea with that repository is provide a way for you to service all your applications to your Pi in your house. And so what we want to do is say, okay, cool, so I have my repository of applications. Pi starts up, and as soon as this is up, we'll switch over to the Pi, um, and it will provide those bundles dynamically to the Equinox container. And I apologize, I'm talking to you. Yeah, I um, just wanted to make sure the, the clock was actually deployed here, right? We don't actually need to see that in the start of the Fair enough. Okay, so what we see here is just a standard Raspbian install on the Pi running right here on my desk. Um, and I've gone ahead and downloaded the, the front end, the PyPlug front end. The PyPlug front end is just a uh, RCP application. It's very lightweight, only what was it, like 12, 15 bundles, something really small. <coughs> Um, so I'm going to unfire that. I can't see, so you guys have to tell me if I'm typing the wrong thing. Okay, so we have a very clean... Oh, and I should also say, um, you really want to install Java 8, because Java 8 has optimizations for ARM, um, so it runs a lot faster with Java 8 installed. Um, and I think Mike said that the, the official release of that was supposed to be yesterday. I never went back and looked, so we're running in early access of Java 8 right now. And then I'm just going to bring up the uh, PyPlug front end. And what you're going to see here is, as it starts up, it's going to um, try and connect to the daemon that's running on Tim's machine, and then see what bundles are there, and download those bundles, and then automatically load them in. And it's all using real simple Eclipse um, extension points. Right? So we try to make it as simplistic as possible so it's super easy to get going and start creating a plugin or an app right off the bat. So we can see the clock that Tim has deployed. And if I can find my mouse. Wow, that clock has to be tough. Here you are. There it is. All right. And it's just a simple clock app. This is an SWT composite. We're just painting straight on there. So if you're good at painting in SWT, then you can start programming on your Pi really quickly. Now, there are um, many, many things. We're going to get more advanced than just a clock. The clock is just a fun starting point. Um, so if we switch back to the, the presentation. Have we got this down now? Cool. All right, Jay. Thanks, Tim. So each application, we made a simplifying, a couple simplifying um, assumptions. One, we're just going to have one app per bundle. So 
It's kind of a one-to-one -one relation. Each bundle is an app in the Podflow frame. Um, you just extend one extension point to determine the, that determines the life cycle of each app in the Podflow frame. And then, if you need to, you can deploy some additional services. It's not usually necessary, but sometimes you want to be able to do it. And what do you get out of that? Well, you get SWT, JFace, you've already got a display, you've got a Java runtime already up and running, so you don't have to pay for any of that uh, during your development or during your run, you know, when you're just using it, you know, to control whatever you're controlling in your house. So let's take a look. This is a little bit squinty here, sorry, but this is the interface you have to implement. So it's very simple. Um, if you're not familiar with doing interfaces yet, you know, if you're new to Eclipse, um, this might actually be a good place to start. You could learn how to do uh, Eclipse development using just one simple interface, right? This one. But let's take a look at each of the methods. So the install is going to be called when the PyPlug front end detects a new plugin out on the daemon and downloads it and installs it into the OSJ runtime. And then the prepare is the method that uh, you implement to create your composite, to do all the things that are going to create widgets on the PyPlug um, screen. And then the next method is the uh, resume, which is called both at the beginning of your app when it's run the first time, and then after a suspend, it'll be called again if the user goes back into your app. So that allows you to write apps that have sort of a pause and resume functionality. Um, and this is going to like start a background threads to do animations and things like that. Um, and then the suspend should stop those background threads and uh, basically stop using the CPU because you don't want to be using the CPU while you go to a different app. So you can really think of it as sort of like a cell phone right? interface, right? You, you don't want to be using CPU while you're not using that app in your cell phone. And then finally, there's the shutdown, which we're going to call um, when we unload the bundle, right? And so the point is we want to get rid of all references so that OSGI can cleanly unload that bundle. And this is something that Eclipse has been trying to do for years and years and have that dynamic bundle unloading. When you're in a really lightweight situation like this, it's really simple to do that, right? It's much harder to do it in the IDE. So Tim, why don't you give us a little bit of an overview of what we need to think about when we're programming? Sure. So as Jed was indicating, uh, we're in a, a very lightweight device right now. Back to the clip start of time in 10 minutes. Uh, and so as Jed was talking about with those, those methods, one of the reasons why uh, if you're an OSGI purist, you say, well, why aren't we just using uh, you know, metadata out of the bundle? We found trying to optimize the performance of the Pi really came around to when you were activating loading jars and trying to do it just as you access it became very slow. Uh, so in our case, we're actually starting, we're getting the bundles running, ready for the user to interact with them. Uh, and so these bundles now are, are, are running inside the runtime. Uh, you have the shared Equinox container. So if you're not familiar with Equinox, Equinox is what allows all these plugins in Eclipse to work. It's this really low level container. And it has functions like installing and uninstalling bundles, starting bundles. A bundle is you know, enough a name for a plugin. And so we have this Equinox container. And so that's awesome because now what we can do is dynamically deploy these services out to the runtime. And that's really what your application is. An application is just this little bundle. And what's cool about that now is you can dynamically uninstall and install it into the same container. So you get really nice performance characteristics. So instead of spinning up a whole other VM, paying another expense and startup, uh, or if you have shared services in a, in a lower level services bundle, those can be readily available as you deploy newer versions of your bundles. So we're going to go switch over to uh, a kind of a bit more interesting demonstration. Um, so uh, we were going to go ahead and deploy some additional applications. Um, so I think we're going to go ahead and do uh, some Zork games and uh, a Snake game. I forgot the yellow, do that later. So let's go ahead and switch back over to the Pi. Okay. Yeah, okay. Wow, that's impossible to click on. Can we not see this? <laughs> there we go. All right. Okay, so we see that the uh, that the Python <coughs> front end found those apps that we had deployed. It's really pretty snappy. It's, it's really fun. And in fact, the fact that you can do things this quick makes it um, possible to do iterative programming really quickly. They're all SWT apps, so you could be doing them just on your desktop, but maybe you've got some integration with stuff running on your Pi, and so you want to have the app running on your Pi uh, when you're doing your iterative development. So, Tim, do you want to uh, redeploy the clock? Should we do that? Sure. Why don't we dive in and just talk about resume? So you go inside. All right, sure. Yeah. So let's play Snake. 
um, and do some resume. So one of the things when you're building your application, you need to decide the life cycle. So Jen's going to play two different games. He's going to try to play Snake where it can not see well. Uh, at our booth, we had a separate monitor hooked up for the potty. Now we remember why we uh, talked about me doing that here. Uh, so Jen seems to be doing pretty well. Um, and so Snake is an interactive game. It's running background threads to be able to automatically put out for you to have random math for uh, you know the, the different things you're going to play with. Uh, so when you suspend it and come back into Snake, it's going to kind of pick up where you left off. In this case, all the resources are frozen and then brought back up. If we go into another game, I don't know if you've ever, if you remember Zork. Um, we were having fun playing Zork recently. So if Jed can find that, uh, the X again. <laughs> <laughs> no? The mouse went up to the top left. Well, I can undeploy it and that would kick you out of the game. So we can do that as well. That's a different way of doing it, yeah. So why don't we do that? <laughs> Um, so just like you can install bundles, you can uninstall bundles. Um, so I'll just take a moment to go out. Um, so once we get into Zork, Zork has a different uh, use of characteristics. So inside Zork, um, you're able to. Wait, wait, wait. Are you not able to? There we go. Okay. Oh, and right. just unimportant. Okay. Cool. Right. Right. So uh, inside Zork, uh, Zork is a kind of a, a turn-based game, and so. For Zork, we were looking at the lights like, okay, what should an application like Zork be? And then, <coughs> or you click the clock and say this works. Yeah, like it's said, very hard to see. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Only for Zork. That's right. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so anyway, the, the fun thing with Zork is it's actually just a port of a regular Java game, uh, ported over to SWT. It's full canvas painting. It doesn't look sexy at all, to be fair. All right, it's a, it's a fun game, it's addictive. You've got to walk west, you've got to go east. Um, it's very hard to read on, on the color, so if I was quicker, I'd actually just change the app to have a different color scheme, but uh, I don't know if we want to actually try to do that right now. It may derail where we're going with this. Um, so we won't play Zor too much, um, but the idea is to build out these applications that you can uh, you know, use on your TV. And so what we, what we were trying to do is you know, back to why we were doing this fun stuff. If you had this pie, you want to be able to do things, you know, show the house temperature on your pie, show a news feed, whatever it may be, allow you to build out these applications. And that's what we've been kind of having fun with. So uh, we can hook these up to our TV, and now I have an eight-year-old daughter, and I can have kind of fun projects with her, you know, using the pie for interesting things in the real world. And I think that's what's cool about the Raspberry Pi, is it allows you to do these experiments to interact with the, uh, with the, with the world. So I think um, that's... Probably enough is work when you know you got a ticket. So you can type. Away. I can yes. type to get out of that. You can type to get out of that. Thing. So much easier when you can type. Um, so let's go ahead and switch back over and uh, talk about performance. Okay. Uh, so performance is uh, very interesting. And so just to give you a simple anecdote. Uh, when we're working on our Rappel application, we'll use, we'll use in a moment, you'll see it has a background image. And say, cool, all right, instead of coming back to the slides, we'll say, oh, we can write an app for the Pi to, to choose the winners for the, uh, for the Pi. Um, and in doing so, we had a PNG. So why not a PNG or a JPEG for the background image? Much easier than trying to render it all. And so we had this 300K PNG to be able to go up to 1080p and it would look pretty. Uh, and the first run of the application on the Pi took 37 seconds to load the PNG into memory. And we started kind of drilling into what what's the bottleneck? Is it the you know, the, the custom buffered canvas, you know, the image? Is it the actual loading? And it turned out it was 100% the loading. Uh, we could do really efficient scaling of images that was going very well, but the actual loading of that PNG was atrocious. So silly thing, we had to switch to an 8-bit PNG. Still looks fine. Uh, I dropped the resolution and scale it up. Um, but it was surprising watching what you traditionally take for granted when you're building out a UI on the Pi can be a challenge. Now, yes, like you saw in our applications you've shown, you can write applications that are very snappy, very responsive. That snake game uh, is very boring. We repaint the whole UI every time. We could have been more efficient. Uh, we didn't need them. You know, it actually renders really fast. And so there's opportunities to build pretty cool applications on the Pi. Um, as indicated, Java 8, you want to be using. So on our, on our instructions on GitHub, uh, you'll see where you can get the latest Java, install that on your Pi. There's some modules you'll need. Running the Java 8 was something like a 30% increase over some of the earlier versions we had tried for some functions. Uh, more importantly, if you wanted to have fun with Java FX, they now have uh, optimizations for, for ARM in Java FX. But again, it gives you an opportunity to do richer applications. I know Jen and I have been toying with the idea of, doing, of porting the Java Kari uh, 
you haven't seen it, there's a job implementation of Atari so you play ROMs. So we'll be playing Pitfall soon on our buys, um, or whatever your favorite game is. Uh, so again, back to the shared runtime. You want good performance. Yes, you can overclock. No, you don't have to avoid your warranty. Uh, but let's talk a bit more about the actual architecture of the buy as well. So on a previous slide, I don't know if you if you saw that it's basically a three-tier architecture, although that's a little bit heavyweight of a statement, I think. The daemon runs in the middle. That's what keeps track of your deployed applications. Um, it also sends out a UDP broadcast saying, I'm here, I'm here, so that the view can deploy to it and the front end can download the apps from it. Uh, and then we have the PyPlug front end, which is going to, when it detects new apps have been loaded into the daemon, it's going to download those automatically for you. So you don't have to think about pushing out your apps to your Py. You just run the deploy and uh, the front end will just grab them. And then finally, the view is there to make it super simple for you to get those plugins onto the daemon itself. Uh, so this is nice if you've got multiple pies running on the same network. You can actually push out once and have it deployed to all those pies. Back to what Tim was saying about what does it, the Internet of Things mean, you know, there's security I thoughts there that are really interesting, and some of the people we've been talking to have said, nobody knows what's going on in this space yet. There's lots of money going into it, but nobody knows where it's going. So that's another thing that we find really interesting about this is for our uses, we don't need to think about that, right? If it's just going to run in your house, you don't really need to worry about it too much. Um, but as you start to think about using your Pi outside of your house, you know, how do you handle that security? It's a good question. Some of the idiosyncrasies, uh, there's no SWT fragment on uh, Raspbian. And that I found a little bit confusing. I'm not a Linux guy, so I don't know the exact details of why they did that. Um, but it, the SOs are embedded in a module, and um, you run a specific version of SWT. And I'm not even sure how they make that work. Like if I'm running the latest version of SWT and an older version of the, of the SOs, I don't know how that's supposed to work. Also, you're going to get an error about render missing. You can ignore that. Google doesn't know anything about this error. I don't, we searched and searched and didn't find anything. Finally, if you try and build your app with Maven, because that fragment isn't there, um, Tyco gets confused and doesn't want to build your app. It doesn't want to build the front end. You can use it to do all the builds of, of other plugins, but it's just that exporting of the PyPlug front end that Tyco was not excited about exporting. Just a short comment. I, I do have a description how to do that. You have a description on how to do that. Excellent. With the uh, with Tyco build, so you can just. Very cool. Yeah. Well, we have to talk to you about that. Yeah. Did you have a blog about it? Yes. I, we might have tried to follow that blog too. Okay. <laughs> Things <laughs> may have changed yeah. recently. <laughs> uh, and so what we found was, uh, I don't know if it was a change in the, the central neighborhood repositories or whatever it was, but there was something that uh, it looked like uh, the the instructions were uh, kind of augmenting the. The base set, and yeah. it was it was not built. We both spent uh, quite a bit of time trying to get uh, it to correctly assemble, uh, okay. but we'd love to hear more about uh, yeah, how to talk to you about. It. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all up on GitHub. Um, you can go download it. It's all EPL, like Tim said. Install the uh, deploy view into your um, into your Eclipse. Install <coughs> Java. Some you need a couple extra modules. We have all the instructions up on GitHub of how to get started. It's just to you know follow a few steps and then start playing around, start start running it. Um, oh, we missed. I think we missed the. Uh, you want to run it? Okay. Yeah. See, so I think we played this time. We, we blew past one of them. So uh, what we wanted to do is kind of talk about the you know, the rapid development lifecycle. So um, when you're when you're developing with the Pi, it's tempting to try to do all your remote debugging, hot code replacing, and whatnot. And uh, in our experiences, anyways, we found that that was a, a bottleneck to your development. It became uh, slow. And so what we did is instead optimize it so it was very quick for you to uh, deploy out your application um, and continue to redeploy it as well. So if we go back over to the Pi um, and the UI is updating, just, there's a separate name <coughs> next to it. And I think on our local network, it's causing us some network hiccups. Um, so inside the, let's see if it makes sense. Okay, sort of. Uh, well, I guess we'll go on in my parallel projector. Um, so let's say inside the clock app, if you can click on the thing you can't get to. Um, the idea was really to make it very simple for you to quickly uh, roll out your changes. So I could start making, um, what did I just try to lose that thing? Take it back. Uh, 
back in the correct layout. Well done. All right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. Technology. So uh, you will find the Pi uh, is really good at HDMI. Uh, it gets really confused when you fit up a VGA cable pair. Um, so yes, much better on your home TV than uh, uh, anyway. Now it's fine. Miles to say hello. Let's go up top left and go down. Did someone see it? Yeah. Um, it, for a second there, it was at the bottom. It's below Zorf 1. So I know one of the reasons why we have the black background is actually what we found is we started off with white and thought it looked cool, but then on, when you put that on different uh, displays in your house, white looks horrible on uh, most TVs. Uh, so we went black and it looks really sharp on a TV. Horrible idea for, uh, for a talk with. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just deploy another app. One of the nice things is that it'll be the current app will stay in the foreground. And so you can see, look, I changed the whole background color and said it doesn't want face. Um, so I say maybe we wanna, you want to fix the uh, background to also be black. And the whole idea is you're able to very quickly uh, continue to deploy that application and do iterative development. So you're just rapidly deploying, making changes, testing, and seeing run. And when you see those quick refreshes, right when I do that deploy, that's actually a full OSGI transfer over the network. Um, so the laptop's doing a UDP broadcast, and it just, or the Pi is doing a broadcast to discover where the daemon is, connects back to the laptop, says, yeah, I've got a new bundle. The bundle gets deployed, loaded into the Equinox runtime, and immediately refreshes. And so it provides a really nice way for you to prototype out these OSGI bundles you're working on or applications uh, and run them on your UI. All right, so coming back over to uh, our, so the Internet of Things. Um, so the, as you've seen in EclipseCon, there is uh, a lot of attention on this. We have our, um, the Eclipse Day Florence is all about you know, IoT and MDM. Uh, we have a whole track today on IoT. And I think that the, the fun challenge for the Eclipse community is understanding what opportunities are there for us with the source of devices. Now, the Raspberry Pi is not a robust device. You really want to use this on production setting. But it's a great device for a hobbyist to start to experiment with how a device can have a different role in you know, your environment, whether that be in your home, your workplace, whatever it may be. Um, as you start to roll out these devices, though, certain challenges come into play. Uh, as we were talking to somebody from, uh, let's say, Cisco, who was doing a big deploy, a big effort from their uh, you know, funding to the community. I think they've paid like 300,000 or so far in grants to help figure out what does security mean. Because no one really knows. Is it a lockdown device that's owned by a provider? You know, is it like your Comcast cable modem where it's totally locked down and you can't touch it? Is that really an internet of things or is that just another device from some company? Um, and I think the, the interesting thing is as we start to kind of build these mesh of devices out, does it provide new opportunities? Uh, I like to think of the example of, say, if you've used Waze, it's a crowdsourced traffic application. Uh, and it's very interesting because all these devices are contributing information back to uh, you know, Waze and that interesting data. Now, what does that mean for us? Is there interesting data that is uh, accessible from all these devices out on the internet? Is there an opportunity for a collaboration on common data formats or whatever it may be to kind of archive cool temperature data or whatever it may be, whatever people are doing with, their, with these devices? But once you do that, you know, who owns the data and who owns the device? What are the security constraints? How do you deploy applications? Do you own the devices in your home or the person, the, the company that's trying to make a, a business venture with the devices? Um, so we'd love to have dialogues uh, with whoever's interested regarding security in particular. It seems like a really fascinating place. We do have our security delivery center where we do that for Eclipse. And say, Eclipse is easy. All right, sure. You have plugins and you have teams and you have team leads and you can dictate policies around you know, who can roll out software. But what's the parallel to your Pi device? You know, again, it's just this cost device. And it has a shared OSGI container. It could run many services. How do different providers provide cool plugins for those services that then collaborate together? So I think there's going to be some fun challenges coming up. Uh, it's a lot of unknowns. Uh, so we look forward to, uh, again, talking about that. So we're going to go ahead and switch over, stay on track with our schedule here. And we're going to deploy the draft application. Um, so Jed, if you'll. Try to bring your, I'll undeploy your clock. Thank you. <laughs> but now I still don't know where my mouse is. <laughs> it seemed like a good idea using the Python clock. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right, we'll go right now. Uh, uh, hey. Yeah. Yeah. Are you more listening? So. All right. Uh, Iris, how many do we have? 
60? Wow, thanks guys. You're making us proud. All right, so on the back of your sticker, hopefully you win. Uh, swing by the booth to pick up if you are a winner. Um, we'd love to talk to you more about playing with your pie. We'd love to have you guys interact on GitHub with us. Um, start playing with the project as well. And um, yeah, like Tim said, we'd love to have more discussions about what this stuff means. It's very interesting um, in many different ways. We can't see the numbers on the right. Ah, uh, let's try this. There we go. And we are giving away more uh, pies later in the day as well. If you didn't win, at 345 we're doing another another set of pies as well. And you just come by and scan your badge and we'll give you the answer to that as well. Um, so thank you very much for uh, coming to our talk today. Uh, we appreciate your time and look forward to talking more with you guys.